we'll go to the next presentation, uh, which will be by Dr. Renat Jesselson, who is at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. The title of her presentation is HER2 Signaling and the ER Cystrome. Renat? All right, thank you. So first, I'd like to thank the organizing committee for the opportunity to present uh, HER2 signaling the ER system in a session honoring Kent Osborne, who is truly uh, an inspir ins inspirational and role model physician scientist. These are my disclosures. So in my presentation today, I will talk about the estrogen receptor, or in short, ER system, the plasticity of the ER system, which is a component of the plasticity that Rachel just spoke about, how HER2 and other receptor tyrosine kinases reprogram the ER system, and lastly, I will show some new data, very early data, about HER2 and ER interplay in primary ER positive HER2 negative or low HER2 breast cancers. So when ER is activated, it is translocated to the nucleus where it binds to chromatin and to ERE sites or estrogen responsive elements and facilitates the transcription of hundreds of genes. However, when we look at this cartoon, we actually do not see the full picture. And if we zoom out, we recognize that ER binds to chromatin in thousands of sites. And it is the genome-wide binding sites of ER that make up the ER system, a term that was coined by Miles Brown from DFCI. And when Jason Carroll um, was in Miles' lab, they showed that ER binds mainly in enhancer regions, and most of ER binding is dependent on chromatin opening by FOXA1. Using the chip sequencing assay in the lab, we can identify the genome-wide binding sites of the transcription factor. And when we integrate that data together with, with transcriptomic data, we can identify the direct target genes of a transcription factor. We now know that the ER system is highly dynamic and context-dependent. And this ER system plasticity is, in highly, is very important because it results in major transcriptional changes. The ER system plasticity is also highly clinically relevant. And we know that for many studies, as shown, some, as shown here some examples, the ER system is different in different tissue types. It is different in normal tissue versus breast cancer, in endocrine treatment sensitive versus resistant breast cancers, in high risk metastatic versus low risk breast cancers. And more recently, my group showed that the ER system is different in invasive lobular cancers versus invasive ductal cancers. We performed chip sequencing in a number of models of invasive lobular cancer and invasive ductal cancer. And as you can see here in the sample sample correlation plot, this ER systems of invasive lobular cancers cluster together and segregate from invasive ductal cancers. And this is due to close to 7,000 ER binding sites that are unique to invasive lobular cancers, as you can see here in this heat map that depicts the binding density across all ER binding sites. And when we looked into these unique ER binding sites in ILC, we saw that they were enriched in FOXA1 motifs. And when we performed FOXA1 chip sequencing, we indeed saw that the invasive lobular cancers were enriched in FOXA1 binding in these sites. Importantly, we showed that high expression of the genes that are induced by these ILC unique ER FOXA1 binding is associated with increased risk of recurrence, specifically in luminal A invasive lobular cancers. Thus, through these analyses, we were able to identify a potential signature that can detect invasive lobular cancers that are of high risk of recurrence, albeit having a low molecular subtype um, risk. So there are a number of mechanisms that facilitate the ER system plasticity, and among them are alterations of the SWI sniff complex, genetic alterations of ESR1 and FOXA1, as well as interactions between ER and other transcription factors, including other nuclear receptors. And these interactions between ER and other transcription factors can either lead to decreased ER activity, such as in competitive DNA binding, 
or in the squelching of key transcriptional proteins in the transcriptional machinery, such as uh, ER coactivators. These interactions can also increase ER activity, as in cooperative DNA binding and chromatin opening by a pioneer transcription factor, as I have shown for FOXA1, and also in a tethering mechanism by which ER binds to a different transcription factor, such as the AP1 complex. HER2 and other receptor tyrosine kinases also reprograms the ER system. And evidence for this was shown already in 1992, uh, when Kent Osborne and his group has shown that overexpression of HER2 in ER-positive HER2-negative breast cancer drives tamoxifen resistance while retaining ER dependency. And mechanistically, growth factor stimulation results in ligand-independent ER phosphorylation by MAP kinase, which increases ER transcriptional activity. In addition, growth factor activation of MAP kinase modulates ER activity through the phosphorylation of key co-activators, such as SRC3, or also called AIB1. Clinically, the correlative analysis of the SWOG8228 clinical trial, which is a study, was a study of tamoxifen as, as a single agent in first-line treatment of metastatic ER-positive breast cancer, showed that ER-positive tumors that were HER2-positive had a, a decreased benefit from endocrine treatment. And in cell lines, in line with these uh, early data, in cell lines, the ER system in ER positive, HER2 positive cells is very different from the ER system in ER positive, HER2 negative cells, as shown in red and blue. In addition, the ER positive, HER2 positive system resembles the system in cells that acquire tamoxifen resistance. And this is due to more than 8,000 ER binding sites that are gained in both the ER positive HER2 positive cells as well as the tamoxifen resistant cells. And these binding sites are enriched in PAX2, AP1, and FOXA1 motifs. So let's take a closer look to see what are the effects of receptor tyrosine kinase signaling in response to growth factor stimulation. So when we look at proliferation, we see in ER-positive HER2-negative cells, um, estrogen stimulation and growth factor stimulation increases proliferation as shown in red and blue. And the growth factor stimulated proliferation is ER-dependent. As you can see, when you add full viscera and two growth factors, the growth factor effect on proliferation is lost as shown in purple. When looking at transcription, growth factors stimulate the upregulation of genes that are very different from those stimulated by estrogen, and a high proportion of these genes are ER dependent. And growth factor stimulated ER systrum is very different from estrogen stimulated systrum, as shown here in this Venn diagram. And as you can appreciate in the orange circle, there are thousands of ER binding sites that are unique to growth factor stimulation. And these sites are enriched in AP1 motifs, suggesting an ER-AP1 interaction that is, in, that is, that is um, associated with genes that are overexpressed in HER2-positive breast cancers versus HER2-negative cancers, and also overexpressed in poor outcome breast cancers. And Luca Malorny, when he was in Rachel's group, uh, looked at the genes that are dysregulated in tamoxifen-resistant models versus their sensitive counterparts and showed that these genes are enriched in the genes associated with growth factor-induced ER binding. And not surprisingly, uh, these, these overlapping genes are involved in networks of ERB2, PI3 kinase, um, AP1, and stress response. Importantly, Silencing of the AP1 complex in the tamoxifen resistant xenograft uh, model that Rachel just showed using a dominant negative C June restored endocrine sensitivity. So these studies suggest a working model in which upregulation of HER2 or activation of receptor tyrosine kinase signaling leads to estrogen independent ER activation that is characterized by an ER AP1 interaction leading to the transcription of genes of stress response and endocrine resistance. AP1 blockade can restore endocrine sensitivity, and this model also suggests that AP1 blockade together with ER degradation will have superior anti-tumor activity. 
So to date, most of the studies looking at the impact of HER2 signaling on the ER axis have investigated models of either overexpression of HER2 or increased activation of receptor tyrosine kinases as an adaptive mechanism or tumors that are ER positive, HER2 positive pos uh, breast cancers. But what about HER2 signaling in ER positive, HER2 negative, but HER2 low breast cancers, as we are now recognizing that this is an important entity? So we looked at the mRNA levels of HER2 in ER positive, HER2 negative cohort, and the ER positive and HER2 positive cohort in the TCGA cohort. And as you can appreciate here in the top graph is that the expression level of HER2 is highly variable. And as noted before, in or here positive HER2 negative tumors, most of them have some degree of mRNA expression of HER2. In addition, you can see that there's some degree of overlap between HER2, HER, ER positive HER2 negative, and ER positive HER2, uh, HER2 negative tumors. And when we look specifically at the ER positive HER2 negative tumors and divide them to tertiles based on HER2 mRNA levels, and then perform gene expression analyses comparing these two uh, cohorts, we can see that the ER, ER positive HER2 negative tumors that have higher mRNA expression of HER2 have higher ER classical signaling. And when we look at the full spectrum of HER2 in ER positive breast cancer, we see that classical ER signaling is higher in either the ER positive HER2 negative lowest mRNA level or in ER positive HER2 positive breast cancers, while in ER positive HER2 negative cancers, higher ER signaling is, is um, associated with higher HER2 mRNA levels. So these results suggest that the effect of HER2 on the ER axis in ER positive HER2 low is different from what we know in ER positive HER2 positive breast cancers. So to conclude, the ER cisterm plasticity is highly clinically relevant. HER2 and other receptor tyrosine kinase signaling leads to the rewiring of the ER system through an ERAP1 interaction, which in turn promotes the transcription of genes related to endocrine resistance, and endocrine sensitivity can be restored by AP1 blockade. Studies to better understand the effects of HER2 signaling on the ER axis in ER positive HER2 low tumors are needed. So with this, I would end and would like to thank all the members of my lab, my collaborators at Dana-Farber, and my collaborators from Baylor, um, Ken Osborne, and Rachel have been fantastic f collaborators over the past many years. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Renat. We have a question in microphone number three. Yes, Mark Lipman, Georgetown. First of all, I'd like to thank the first two speakers whose wonderful talks really won appropriately honor Kent, whose recognition in this seminar is deeply deserved. For the second speaker, you talked about systromic plasticity, but I think you have possibly omitted one other critical area that this may occur through, which is something we've recently described, which is ligand-induced systromic variability. We've shown recently with Joyce Slingerland that estrone, shockingly, is not simply a weaker agonist, but induces a much more inflammatory pathway, a whole different range of genes that promote metastasis. In fact, estrone pellets in many of these models induce metastatic disease. So I think that we should not just simply say estrogen anymore in these settings, but give some serious thought, because estrone, of course, is the critical estrogen of postmenopausal women, and this may well be the explanation whereby as total estrogen levels fall as women age, breast cancer risk goes up. Thank you very much for your comment. Uh, microphone number five, please. Vogel, New York. Dr. Jesselson, thank you for talking in a level even a simple clinician can understand. So AP1 blockade sounds very attractive. How can we achieve this? and restore sensitivity to hormonal manipulations in our patients who have failed five or six of them. Yeah, so targeting uh, transcription factors that don't have a ligand are, is very challenging, and notoriously they're considered undruggable, uh, undruggable targets. However, I think now with 
some of the antibody drug conjugates. Maybe we are at a time where we could think about targeting them using a specific uh, antibody on the surface of a cell that could internalize and then uh, target a, a transcription factor since targeting transcription factors in a non-specific manner could have potentially a lot of toxicity. Microphone number three, please. Nick Murray from Adelaide. Uh, you told us about lobular versus ductal cancers and how um, FOXA1 led to a different pattern of expression driven by estrogen in the lobular. Is that because there are different levels of FOXA1 in ductal versus lobular? Or, or is it because the pattern of expression is just different? And if it's because of different levels, do we have any knowledge of why that is? Yeah, uh, thanks for that question. Um, so, based on our work in the preclinical models, we saw that, it, that yes, the level of FOXA1 is higher um, in the lobular breast cancers, which is likely what we think is the driver of these differences in um, the ER system. And uh, we did show, we did find a mechanism, and this is through a unique, uh, a lobular unique super enhancer that's upstream to FOXA1. And we were able to show by uh, CRISPR I that we can deactivate this enhancer region and really lower FOXA1 and lower um, the transcription of some of these genes. I have a question, Renat. So um, the comments you made about HER2 low versus HER2 plus. Yeah. Right, if I understand correctly, HER2 amplified suppresses ER signaling, but HER2 low, your analysis of HER2 low suggests that in HER2 low is the opposite. Yeah, so this is, diff yeah, this is HER2 signal, it's ER signaling, it's not necessarily ER levels, um, which is different. Um, I didn't show it, but we didn't see differences in ER levels in these different cohorts from, from this study that we did. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Uh,